The Mind's Eye with BJ Turnoff is available on Stitcher Radio, Podbean, iTunes, and all major platforms. Thanks for listening. Thanks for subscribing. Feed your head, engage your brain, and enter the mind's eye, the intersection of history and mystery, science and the strange, and crime and the sublime. I'm your humble host, DJ BJ Turnoff of this audio torium of audacity. I think of all the classic rock artists that have passed in the uh, past uh, few years. Uh, above all of them, I think I'm, I might miss Tom Petty the most. Uh, outside of Willie Nelson, I mean, he, Tom Petty has definitely got to be in your top three of artists that you want to smoke a joint with, right? Or, or go get a beer at a bar off Ventura Boulevard. But no, no, we're not going to make this sad in any way tonight. This is a celebration of the man... We're throwing a birthday bash for the man on what would have been his 70th birthday. Tom Petty, as you can imagine, he had a pretty amazing life. Uh, he, he met the king as a kid. He played with two Beatles, and he backed the man in black. And those are just a few of uh, some of the amazing stories uh, about him uh, that our guest Paul Zolo is going to share with us tonight. Paul Zolo is a, a noteworthy singer and songwriter of his own kind, on top of being a uh, author, journalist, and photographer. Back in the early 2000s, Tom Petty authorized Paul to conduct a series of in-depth discussions with him about his life, career, and songwriting. Eventually, that all coalesced into the book, Conversations with Tom Petty. Unlike a lot of other classic rock artists, uh, Tom never came out with an autobiography, so this is it. This is uh, the man in his own words. So we are very lucky to have Paul Zolo join us tonight. Uh, we'll be right back in a Mind's Eye moment. Appreciate you rocking out with us on the Mind's Eye. For the most part, my life really hasn't changed too, too much with COVID uh, and the pandemic. You know, I was a home buddy to begin with. Um, luckily, also, my day job never really stopped. And doing this podcast is, is mainly a home thing also. We're all struggling with different things that we miss. And for me, most of all, uh, what I miss the most is, is live music and live concerts. I mean, there's really nothing like that magic there, just being in a pit or uh, or just singing along to your favorite artist, seeing them in person with, with the person who, do you, who you don't even know next to you, but you're both hugging and singing at the top of your, uh, of your lungs. And I can't wait for that to get back. But uh, in the meantime, there is some encouraging and, and really some fun news out there on that front. The Flaming Lips, if you're not familiar with them, definitely uh, you should. They recently performed a socially distant show. Uh, how'd they do it, you ask? Uh, pretty pretty phenomenal. The band and the crowd, they were all inside these uh, individual giant bubbles. I would totally do that right now. Definitely, come, uh, Hopefully they come uh, come our way or, or someone in, in my or, or your city will, will steal that idea. Uh, but uh, you really do got to see it uh, to believe it. Uh, we, we have the video posted up on our Facebook and Twitter pages at Minds Eye Show, or just go to quick links at our website, themindseyemedia.com, themindseyemedia.com. All right, all right, the hardest part is over now, the waiting. Come on, you know I had to do at least at least one of those dad jokes. Headlighter Paul Zolo joins us to share some stories uh, from his own conversations with Tom Petty. The Mind's Eye will be right back. Paul Zolo, singer, songwriter, author, journalist, photographer, uh, one hell of a human being. Paul, thanks for coming to celebrate Tom Petty's birthday. Thank you. It's my great pleasure to talk about Tom and to be here with you. Thanks for asking. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, hopefully, you'll relive a lot of uh, good memories uh, that we'll talk about. And but before we, you know, break into and and break down Tom Petty, let's let's break down a little bit about you, Paul Zolo. Tell listeners a, a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I was born in Chicago, uh, raised on uh, on music. I mean, I loved the Beatles, Dylan, Simon and Garfunkel, and my 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 dream was always to be a, a songwriter. I never considered writing about music so much, but. Uh, Went to school in Boston, then came out to Hollywood uh, around 1981, and I got a job working at the National Academy of Songwriters, which was a nonprofit set up to help songwriters and educate them and help them professionally. And they had what well, was kind of a newsletter, and I, I kind of worked my way into becoming the editor of that. And uh, they had all these famous songwriters who were gold members, as they called them. Uh, and I said, well, why don't we ask them to do interviews with us? And my boss said, you, you could try. I don't know if they'll say yes. And 
I called Frank Zappa was the first one I called, and they said, yes, you could come over today. Yeah. And that just started me on this adventure of mission of like interviewing the world's great songwriters. Uh, because, you know, being a songwriter and a musician, the idea being to really talk about the, the process and really get into what songwriting is really about. Because uh, so often when I'd read about great songwriters, especially growing up, they'd very rarely ask a question like, how did you write that? How do you do that? And I was dying for that. And in fact, songwriters love it when you really get into it. And especially because I'm a songwriter, I generally will learn the song musically so I can play it as well. So that gives me a you know way of seeing the whole song, which is the fullness of the songwriter's genius. And that really appealed to them. So that's led to you know, many great, really in-depth uh, interviews. And I got an interview with Bob Dylan, which was, mm. was great. And uh, after that, I ran. Uh, Tom Petty was at a, at a show called The Troubadours of Folk Show. He was playing with uh, Roger McGuinn. Yep. And I just went up to him. And this doesn't always work, you know, just to go up to the artist, because sometimes the management or whoever doesn't like that. But uh, I went up to him, and he knew already about the Dylan one, because I was said hi, I would, wanted to ask you if you'd do an interview for Song Talk. And he goes, yeah, I love that Dylan one, sure do it you know he told me uh, to talk to mary clauser who was one of his managers and they set it up and that that set us on a on a great uh, a journey because i interviewed him twice for that and then pretty much every album after that and uh then i came up i think uh it was around 2004 i invited him he considered doing a whole book of conversations uh i don't know if he'd go for it but it just so happened it was good timing because uh, uh people there had never been a book on tom at that point uh, and people wanted one, and yet he didn't want to sit down and write a book, and he enjoyed our conversations. So uh, that's kind of was good timing and uh, good luck that uh, led us to do the whole book, which came out in 2005. Mm-hmm. And then sadly, when Tom died in 2017, and you know, I was at, I was actually at his, what turned out to be his last show at the Hollywood Bowl with with my son. Uh, you know, it was just shocking and awful, and uh, of course, it's still kind of hard to deal with, but the book immediately went out of print because people wanted it, so it vanished. And they were selling it for a huge amount online. So uh, so the publisher and I uh, got together and with, with Tom's wife, Dana's Blessing, we did a new version, which uh, came out this year called the Expanded Edition. And, and you touched on a lot there, and I want to you know, get, into, get into all of that. And, and it seemed like Tom Petty, of all the rock stars, would be the type of guy who you could just go up to at a bar, you know, the troubadour and, and say, Hey, can, can we, can we do an interview pretty much? And, you know, tell us what your, I guess, initial impression of, of Tom Petty is and how it, that stayed the same and, and maybe changed throughout the, the years and, and getting to know him, particularly over those conversations over mm-hmm. those couple of years. Well, he was one of the guys I met that was really a happy surprise to discover. He was a really great guy. He was really a sweet man, a caring person, and a good guy, and and he loved music so much. He had so much authentic passion for it. So I was happy to learn, you know, when I started working with him, that he's he's so much fun to work with, and he was such an amazing storyteller, as his fans know. I mean, in his songs, but uh, you know, anytime he would express emotions, whether it's on stage in front of fifty thousand people, it's compelling. And you, and uh, and so it's just such a wonderful opportunity. And We'd meet every Saturday at uh, one of his houses in Malibu. We had a big, giant one with Dana and a, a tiny one where he and Dana would go to get away. Mm-hmm. And uh, and not once was it was it not fun. He always was ready to go and in a good mood. And I knew it was good then, but since then I've done books and projects with other people, and it really showed me what a good guy he was. Because mm-hmm. the others were were so many so many uh, difficulties and challenges in so many ways. They'd have different attitudes, or it just was very hard or just would be kind of sketchy wouldn't be professional tom was never that way and he was also smart in that he didn't want to ever make work a drag so we we would never do more than about two hours at a time and we'd meet at noon always because he that's when he got up he kept rock and roll hours <laughs> and uh really a, a sweet guy and uh and appreciative uh, he liked that i did my my homework that i came in you know truly knowing how to play the songs and you know it, the thing about Tom I found is, uh, is this, you know, people that love him probably understand, his songs were so good that I think they're deceptively simple, because he was so good that it, it seemed like it just spilled out of him. And so I think for that reason, he didn't get the credit for being a genius songwriter the way a more obvious genius like Dylan or Lennon did. And I think he, he knew he deserved it. And the truth is, he, he, 
he kept up his songwriting at a tremendous level for 40 years and had so many hits, really many more hits than pretty much anyone except, you know, the Beatles, very, very other few that had that many. Uh, and the thing that really impressed me about him was, well, number one, he loved music and songwriting, but he really worked hard at his songwriting. He was so diligent. Uh, he would, he had what he called his E songs and his B songs. And if he felt a song wasn't good enough, it wouldn't get on the, the album. And he always worked, even when, when he was very young, he realized, uh, you know, when the Heartbreakers started, that he would be required to write 10 songs a year. And not just 10 any songs, 10 really good Tom Petty songs. So he said, I could have gone out and been the rock star and gone to premieres, but I had to stay home and write. So he kind of complained about it, but at the same time, he loved it. You know, when he talked about a great song, nothing made him, uh, made him happier. So it was good to, for me to see that, too, that, you know, he didn't become a great songwriter just randomly or out of luck. He, he had, obviously, a lot of talent but, uh, and determination, but he worked really hard. And, uh, I think it's a good lesson. I think that was something that I really took away from the book that, you know, there's perception and reality and they don't necessarily align. And Tom is a really great example of that because, you know, for me as a fan looking from out where, you know, out in, uh, you know, he always seems kind of like a, a real relaxed and this is, I guess, part of his image as well, that relaxed, chill, laid back dude. But when in reality, I mean, he's real workmanlike and, and in many ways, he's actually really not chill or relaxed at all. He's real intense in ways. Exactly. You know, it's funny, he said uh, in the book that one of his daughters said, you know, Dad, everyone has this image of you as a laid-back guy, and you are so not that guy. <laughs> and it was true, and he was more that way, more turbulent when he was younger. Uh, after Dana, he he was able to integrate parts of himself, but for a long time he was very neurotic to the extent that he was always worrying about things, and uh, he wouldn't listen to any of his old music because it just rep- he, he just heard the imperfections or it triggered, you know, sad memories. And uh, when he met Dana, she started playing one of his albums, and he said, I'm sorry, we don't listen to that here. And she said, I'm sorry, I'm a Tom Petty fan. That's who I listen to, so deal with it. And he said to me, uh, so I listened to it, and you know what? It wasn't so bad. <laughs> that was hilarious. Like, yeah, Tom, we knew that, but that he actually, you know, was realizing that. And So now knowing that, in retrospect, I realized he enjoyed doing the book, because it really forced him to go through all the albums, and he, he kind of had a reevaluation of a lot of his work. Uh, and it was cool, too, at one point, because I would come in, you know, as I said, knowing the songs and having a lot of research that I would do. And, and uh, he said, you know what, Paul? From now on, tell me in advance what songs you want to talk about, so I'll do my homework. <laughs> and, uh, and he did. You know, he would listen to the songs, and then he would come in with a, a lot of knowledge. And I really appreciated it. That was very professional for him to do that. It was also kind of funny because people that read the book said, you know, it's hard to believe someone like Tom Petty, who, uh, you know, is known to smoke pot a lot, would remember things for so long, you know, but that was, you know, helped by the fact that he did it. He did some prep. <laughs> well, I mean, he really and he really brought great tidbits and and you can tell in, in certain questions that you bring up to him talking about his music, you know, it really kind of jumped off the, the page how much he was really enjoying talking about it and, and reliving a lot of those those memories that, you know, you kind of jarred from his memory. Uh, um, and, and it really kind of bled through the, through the page, and it was just a really great and enjoyable read. And uh, going back to his oh, family, yeah. oh, yeah, and going back to his family, you said that, you know, they described him as neurotic, but how else would they describe him? You know, how was his relationship with his wife? I mean, it seemed like they had a great relationship with his friends, his children. I mean, just he seemed like he was just really loved by all everyone who knew him. Uh, you know, I don't know much about how he was with his daughters or his mm. first wife, Jane. When I first met him, it was during Wildflowers, when he was still living in Encino with his kids and with Jane. But uh, soon after that was the divorce, and then he went through a real hard period during the divorce. And I, I saw him during that period, and he was very unhappy. But uh, after that, meeting Dana, he became a happy guy again. But I know many friends of his... Uh, he did such great things for people, yet didn't want everyone to know. You know, he was the kind of person that would really do really helpful, great things for people without drawing attention to it. Uh, well, you know, one example is Roger McGuinn's great guitar got stolen, and I guess they found it was like being sold like on the black market for a lot of money, like 30 grand or something. So Tom bought it for him and gave it to him, you know, but said, you know, this is between us, you know, and uh, mm. what a great thing to do. 
Yeah, I don't, even, I, I don't even think you mentioned that in the book either. I don't think that was in No, there. I didn't I didn't even know that till later. It was just a, that's not the kind of thing he wanted to put out there. And you know, he would sometimes complain like, you know, uh, you know, like the crippled children will come to the show. You really got to go out and see them, you know. I mean, he was a normal guy in that uh he had a hard time sometimes with with a lot of people. You know, he was kind of shy and he wasn't always comfortable with a lot of people, but so he had to put up with certain things. But generally he was He's really beloved, and you know, since he's been gone, I've, I've met other people that have known him, and it's the reason too why he was very close friends with George Harrison, Bob Dylan. These are like the biggest stars in you know in music, obviously, but they loved Tom because he was a real guy, and he treated them like a real guy. I mean, he said that about Dylan. It's like if you treat him like a regular guy, he really appreciates it, you know. So uh, Tom was really a, a special friend to a lot of people. And, I mean, since doing the book, I had a couple of times when people wanted me to interview him. There was one for the Grammys about the uh, Beatles anniversary and Ed Sullivan. And I asked him to do it, and he did it. And he said, I, I did it because it was you. <laughs> you know, it's so unusual. You know, I've you know, interviewed so many other people, but really no one quite, quite like him. And, and also, he really cared about his fans. I think people understand that. But I think he cared more about his fans than uh, most people in his position. And I think that's why his passing seemed to touch so many people. I mean, not the fact that he was just one of the greatest artists, but you know, it seemed that his fans were really. Everyone had to, has kind of have like their Tom Petty passing story, where they were yeah. when. You know, I have one, um, and and because of and the reason for that is because he was so friendly, fan friendly. He fought to you know lower prices with tickets and LPs and. Right. I guess let's talk. You know, since since we're on the t- topic a little bit, I mean, what about you? When and when did you? Excuse me. When and where were you when you heard the news? I was actually in my car driving back mm. home from uh, downtown, and I got uh, my my son texted me when the news first came out when Tom was still alive, and uh, you know it was literally one week to the to, to the day of his show, his final show at the Hollywood Bowl, and. I guess other people saw that he was in pain and he was limping a little bit. I didn't notice it myself, and I didn't—I wasn't aware of it at all. But so it was—it was a terrible shock. I mean, like you said, he—he he was a friend. I mean, to his fans, he was a really sensitive. He was a friendly guy, a funny guy. So it was like losing a, a friend, and also that he wasn't—he was only sixty-seven. It, it didn't seem like a. Yeah, I wasn't ready for it by any means. Mm. I mean, since then, I've kind of looked at it in different ways, but. Uh, it was really shocking when I when my son texted me. I was it was one of those situations when I was really hoping it's got to be a hoax. It's got to be a hoax. Mm-hmm. So, uh, sad to hear that. Very sad. It, well, when did you speak to him before that? Uh, how how long had it been? Um, I hadn't spoken to him probably for more than a year, mm. but I did see him that night, and he saw me, which was wonderful because they allowed me to shoot some photos. And, uh, and you're talking about the last show right now. His the last show that he did, he did a three-night stand at the Hollywood Bowl, which was the ending of his big 40th anniversary tour with uh, his band. And a big, long tour, much longer than normal, during which he was in great pain. Uh, so this was his last night. But most of the photographers and press came to the first night at the Hollywood Bowl. So I was, there was me and one other guy in a giant orchestra pit. And during the first song I'm shooting, he came right in front of me and gave me the shot. You know, he could see me right there. And he just gave it, but I was so startled, I didn't actually uh, focus. <laughs> so I missed that first shot. And then being Tom, he probably realized that, and he did it like five more times. He just gave me the shot. And, uh, you know, it was so great that he did, but kind of sad, too, that that was really the, the last time we had a connection. But his wife, Dana, saw those photos, and she goes, oh, yeah, that's Tom. He knew you were there. He felt that, you know, and uh, so that was special. And, and and that was one of my biggest regrets. I was actually living in L.A. at the time, and I was going to go to that last show, actually, but I couldn't find anyone to go with. And for whatever reason, that time, I was like, I just didn't feel like going to a concert by myself. I was like, I'll get them the next time. And, uh, you know, of course, there, 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 there was no next time. And, you know, that was kind of a, a big lesson that he taught me is that you really just can't live that life that way. You got to just when you got something, you got to kind of got to go for it and. And and that was something yeah. that that kind of also really came through in the book. There was this real philosophical quality within the book, and that you know came from from Tom himself. And he he said a, a, a ton of really profound things to you, and they seem simple from the outside, but really quite complex. And and one thing in particular was that, and this is something that you kind of mentioned before that 
you know, when he was successful and he became successful, he wanted to, he didn't want to be one of those people who was miserable when he was successful. And and that right. seems really simple from the outside, but that's actually really harder than it seems. That's right. That might be a dynamic that a lot of people wouldn't understand. Like, why would you be miserable if you're rich and famous? But as he said many times, he goes, you know, just because you're rich and famous, it, you're still a human being. You have to go through all those things human beings go through. And yet he was, like you said, smart enough to recognize that it was just uh, ridiculous to live your life, that to have attained so much and to bring so much love and you know, inspiration to so many millions of people, literally, to be constantly unhappy yourself. Uh, but the truth is, I don't know if he could have done that without Dana. She was really an angel. I mean, he wrote Angel Dream was the first song he wrote for her. And mm-hmm. getting to know her, I mean, she was just a, a real angel, such a sweet, giving person. As he said, you know, Dana never says a bad word about anyone. She's just a loving person. And she's so supportive of him, too. I mean, she was already a fan, but she'd go to all his shows when he was on tour. And, uh, you know, it, it changed his life. So I, I really think she helped him with that, you know, and, and face his past. There are a lot of aspects of his past that were really hard on him and difficult. He went through a lot of really, really hard stuff. Uh, and he held on to those things. And it was hard for him to shake. And she, she, she enabled him to, to get to that place. But that, that spoke to me, too, when he said, I don't want to be one of those people that's rich and famous and miserable. I felt the same thing. That's so simple, but it's it's harder than people might understand. And I felt that about uh, often a lot of the things he said, even about songwriting, that they might seem simple, but not everyone ever figures that out. Maybe <laughs> because it's so simple, they, they never get it. And another thing that he said is, uh, and this is something I imagine you can relate to as a content creator, is you know, don't let the criti- critic become bigger than the creator, particularly in the creation process. I mean, as a musician and as a writer, I mean, what, how do you reflect upon that? What does that mean to you? Well, that exact quote is from Randy Newman that he said. Oh, right, that. right, right. <laughs> but uh, I think Tom understood that, uh, that you have to be free with it in the first stage, especially while you're writing. Let it flow. But then you can go in and, and work on it. And he was a guy, that, like I said, who, who wouldn't just accept. I mean, other songwriters, that, that one's done, on to the next one. Not Tom. Every aspect, he called it modular songwriting. Every aspect of the song had to be equally good. Like, you couldn't have a strong verse and a weak chorus or a weak bridge or a weak riff or a, a lyric or any line that just didn't work. So he had very high standards. And, and after that initial you know, inspiration, when the song would spill through him, he'd often really go in and really, really work on things. Or sometimes they, they would just be, uh, I mean, there were certain songs that, that did come through him very fast, Refugees, uh, Wildflowers, but other ones were problematic. And he said, uh, yeah, I wasn't sure how to do that, to go from there to there. He said, you know, I, I had to sit there for five hours before I really got it. Hmm. But that's what he did, where other people might have walked away. He stayed there, and, but uh, he also understood, you got to finish the songs. You know, he was a, he was a pro that way. So he, he really seemed to have... Uh, especially by the end, really balance all those uh, aspects of being an artist, but also being a performer, being a cultural figure, you know, being an artist in an industry. There's a lot he he was uh, putting all together, and, uh, you know, I think he figured it out pretty well. <laughs> yeah, just it might be a little bit of an understatement for sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and in one instance, he describes, uh, and it's something that you alluded to before, that uh, writing the music was kind of just a matter of getting yourself into a place where you can receive, where you can get your antenna out in there, where you can kind of get that signal. I mean, expand upon that idea a little bit. What do you think he meant by that? Well, and that songwriting is a is an interesting and uh, unusual pursuit in that you can't build a song the way you could build something physical, like a house from the bottom up, or make a meal. That uh, to, 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 to write a Tom Petty song was, was more a, a journey of discovery than, than inventing the thing. And he would connect with ideas and music, but he he understood it. It was somewhat of a somewhat of a mystical uh, uh, pursuit, and and not something you can completely control. And he liked that aspect of it, and said many times to me, "And it's good, you know, Paul, to not look at it too closely." He says, "I'm kind of superstitious that you could destroy it, but there's a mystery to it." Uh, you know, Leonard Cohen said, "You know." Uh, being a songwriter is like being married to a mystery. There's a certain aspect of it that's mysterious, especially if you're on their level at Tom Petty, where you could connect with something like uh, Southern Accents, and that's a song that's going to live for decades. It created something timeless and and perfect in a way. And uh, 
And he was so excited when that happened. But it didn't always happen. And uh, so when it didn't happen, he, he would work really hard at it. But the other aspect of it, I think, is that he really did love songwriting. Uh, he would sometimes complain about, you know, it's lonely and I had to do it. But so many times he'd say, uh, you know, like when he wrote the song Down South that was on Highway Companion, he goes, I was so excited when I did it. That's the kind of song that makes you want to do it again. And he said that many times. I just wanted to do it again. Or uh, when he was uh, recording Echo, which is known, you know, by his fans as one of his saddest albums. So he, he loved, you know, writing those songs and, uh, and recording it. And he had so much fun recording, you know, uh, the album that he said, you know, I'd, I'd leave and I'd go home that night and write another song just so I have another song to bring in the next day to the Heartbreakers. Mm. And uh, so that just showed me a, it was the joy that he, he got out of writing, even if it was a sad song that is injected into the, the song itself. You feel that. And uh, I think you also feel if it's not there, you know, if a songwriter is just contriving something. But his were authentic, and you, you, you feel that. And for that reason, I, I think they're timeless and, you know, today, actually, as speaking of Timeless Songs, is the the anniversary of when uh, uh, Damn the Torpedoes came out uh, in 79 on this date, uh, October 19th, 41 years ago. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Refugees on that album, but it's, it's as great as ever, you know, and to me, that's real magic. And I think Tom understood that. And he said that, he said, to me, it's really the only kind of real magic there is, music. And he knows it charmed him and entranced him when he was a kid more than anything. And uh, that's all he ever wanted to do. So he, he realized how great it was to be in that position, but how lucky, too, and what a privilege it was. So he, he took it really seriously. And he, there was never a period in his life when he kind of got uh, indifferent or dismissed the importance of, of his songwriting and, and being a great artist. It's funny that he, he, he always said that he never dreamed about doing anything else, but he also said that he uh, never thought about growing old doing that. So, I mean, that's kind of an interesting uh, contradiction. <laughs> well, it turned out not to be a contradiction. He never really grew old. I mean, mm. he was 67, but part of me thinks he never wanted to be like an old Tom Petty. Mm. You know, like at one point, he, he he was always working out to stay in good shape, and he was doing kickboxing, and I asked him, you know, why that? And he goes... Well, the reason is because nobody wants a fat Tom Petty, you know. <laughs> and he could kind of see himself from that, that outside. And it kind of occurred to me that he wouldn't want to be one of those guys that, that uh, diminished. And he'd go see him, and it'd be fun. But he'd go, yeah, you know, it wasn't like the old days, but it's still great to see Tom. He, he went out on top, you know. His last show was, was one of the greatest shows that he's ever given. He was just so celebratory and happy. And part of me thinks that's what he wanted, that he didn't want to... Uh, become a you know an older man yeah, and it, lose any of his you know power yeah it'd be really hard to envision a fat tom petty i just just can't do it quite <laughs> frankly so <laughs> yeah. uh, well let's get to talk about fat let's get a little bit into uh, i guess the salad days uh uh, uh florida uh he in the book, I mean, you really just see moment after moment, they're really just these serendipitous times uh, that really just kind of show that he was going to be a rock star. And one great story that you shared was the time that he met Elvis. Would you would you mind sharing that one for the listeners? No, I don't mind at all. That was a very important uh, event in his life. He said he was, I think, uh, 10 years old. He said, I was just hanging out in the pine straw. You know, he had a, it was a day off from school, didn't have anything to do, and his aunt drove up and uh, invited him to go see Elvis because uh, his uncle was working on the, the film in Ocala in Florida, not, not too far from where they were. And Tom said, you know, the truth is I knew the name, but all I knew was Elvis was that guy who wiggled. That's about all he knew. And, uh, but, you know, why not? I'll go along. That should be interesting. And he went there and he said, I'm not, I wasn't sure if I'd know, you know, him when he came out, but I was looking. But suddenly this guy came out who was just shining, you know, like he was divine. And it was like, there was no question who it was. It was Elvis. And also, everyone went insane, you know, especially all the girls just went crazy. And Tom saw that, and he thought, you know, that's a job I think that guy would enjoy doing. You know? <laughs> I think that's what it, he said. It first, you know, occurred to him that uh, that would be something that he would like. But uh, it, 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 it drove him to quickly educate himself on the music. And so he traded his whammo slingshot uh, uh, to a friend for uh, his sister's uh, Elvis 45s, and he got all of them. And he was known, since he was a little kid, to just be able to immediately absorb 
music or if you're a nursery rhyme or anything, he immediately knew it. And it was the same way with the Elvis records. He absorbed them. He knew them, you know, back and forth and he internalized them. So that had a huge galvanizing uh, effect on him. It really set him on the path. But it was interesting. He never wanted to be Elvis. The, the other, you know, huge galvanizing childhood experience was when the Beatles in 1964 played on Ed Sullivan. And he said, when I saw that, that was it. I don't want to be Elvis. I wanted to be the Beatles. He saw these guys, like uh, four guys working as a unit, like friends who, who just looked like they were on the top of the world and having the greatest time and singing harmony, you know, and they were self-contained. That really appealed to him. And that was always the model. Never did he see himself as a, as a solo artist. Uh, so it was really the combination uh, of the two. And also the love of Elvis really introduced him to uh, 50s rock and roll and, you know, the original uh, architects of rock and roll. And he quickly educated himself. You know, he knew who actually wrote the songs. He, he, he was a smart guy and liked to learn everything he could about what he was doing. So uh, it, it changed his life. And Gainesville kind of like, randomly w was really a musical mecca uh, within Florida. I mean, he, he learned to play piano, I think, with Don Felder from the Eagles. And, and then he also played with Leonard Skinner. So and that was that was another interesting, you know, that's something that I learned that Gainesville was kind of a musical mecca. Yeah, it really was. It's interesting. And Stephen Stills came out of there. And, uh, oh, really? Bo I didn't Diddley even know that, huh? And, yeah, he was there for a long time. And also Bo Diddley was there. And uh, and all the guys in Tom's pan band, you know, Ben Montench and Mike Campbell, you know, just amazing musicians. Uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah uh, Gainesville, you know, is really where he started. Uh, but uh, it was, you're right, it was serendipity that he met great musicians. You know, he met Ben Montench, the keyboardist, when Ben Mont was a kid. And in the book, he said they're at the, the music store, and this kid comes in and plays all of Sgt. Pepper on the organ. Mm. <laughs> it was like, Wow. And uh, it turned out to be Benmont, but uh, they met him a couple of years later, and he was growing up, and that's when they, they were able to get him in, in the band. And it's funny, I mentioned that to Benmont when I saw him last time, and he goes, you know, sometimes Tom exaggerated. I think I might have played one or two songs from Sgt. Pepper. I didn't play the whole thing, I don't think. But, <laughs> but there was no doubt that, you know, the guy was amazingly talented. But Gainesville was also tough for Tom. You know, he had long hair, and it's a town in the South, and, uh, you know, it was long ago in the early 60s, and later... Uh, wasn't accepted to have long hair. His, his dad didn't approve of it, and uh, the only job he could get besides being a musician later was at the uh, the cemetery, where he'd mow the lawn and dig graves with with long hair. And uh, but Gainesville was where you know he first started playing music, and he he really uh, got bands together and really launched his career. He had a bit of a love hate relationship with his dad, and I think that was probably uh, reciprocated as well. Yeah. Well, reciprocated by his father. I don't know if his father had hate for him. But well, it didn't hate for I him, but they had, some, they had lots of issues, that maybe is a better way of framing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I think, as he said, like Tom said, um, and my dad would have preferred I was a more macho guy. His dad liked uh, hunting and fishing and watching sports. Tom didn't like any of that. And his, his dad would insist that he go out on the fishing boat or hunting and then they'd eat the stuff they, they hunted. Tom hated all that. And his dad was a pretty wild guy, unhinged. He said, you know, my dad drove into ditches so often. I thought that was normal. I thought every everyone's father did that. And he was often drunk and uh, violent. Uh, he, Tom didn't tell me that much about the violence. He spoke about it at other times more. But in my book, he said, you know, sometimes he would just pop you out of nowhere. That's how he put it, pop you. <laughs> and uh, he said, to tell you the truth, most of the time I was with him, I was scared. And that, that really got to be scared of your own father. I wasn't aware of that. And his dad would do weird stunts just to, you know, to, to impress Tom. Like when they were on the boat once, an alligator comes up, and his father, with his thumb and forefinger, jammed him into the alligator's <laughs> eye. Ridiculous. Which caused the alligator. I couldn't believe that. I never heard anyone tell me a story like that. And even Tom, when he said it, he repeated it. Like, he took his thumb and forefinger and jammed it. You know, it's just... Because that's the kind of guy he was, or he took a rattlesnake and would swing it around to break its <laughs> neck, you know? And so he was pretty wild, but the touching part is I realized he didn't talk about it as much, but his dad was proud of him, you know, uh, that he had musical talent. His dad bought him his first acoustic guitar, then his first electric guitar, then an amplifier. And sometimes his dad would have his friends over and say, hey, Tommy, why don't you come play us a song? And so... Uh, 
Tom didn't talk about that much, but it showed his dad did have pride and understanding. Uh, but yeah, his his uh, his relationship with his dad was was tough. The one thing to explain his dad's actions would be that uh, one word and one word only: Florida. If you're not a Floridian <laughs> and acting crazy, then you're then you're going to get kicked out of the state. It's really that simple. Um, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and, and how they ended up uh, in Florida, uh, his family is, is just as crazy, and also I guess, really sad, reflecting a, a you know a pretty horrible part of American history. Yeah, you know, and I'd heard, uh, I caught wind of that story, but I thought, may, this seems like a story that's probably not true, so I'll ask him. The story being that his grandfather, on the petty side, was in Georgia, and there was a, that he killed a guy and needed to get out of Georgia to get to Florida. And the reason it was because his, his, his grandfather married a, a full-blooded Cherokee woman that worked at uh, the logging place, and... Uh, as he said, you know, an understatement. And people don't look too kindly on that, you know, a white man with a, an Indian woman. Uh, and uh, they were, they were, it was at night that people came to him, and it looked like they would be in danger. And uh, one thing led to another, and his, his grandfather killed a guy, forcing them to leave uh, Georgia, and they ended up in Florida, which in fact was, you know, a good move for rock and roll. Rock and roll might not have been uh, the same without that murder. <laughs> it's but all these little really joke about murders, but you know. Well, you know, I think we can. Uh, you know, about a hundred years later, we're all right with that one. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and and those, like you said, it's all these moments that just kind of come together to to produce this phenomenal rock star, uh, and all these moments that that come together and show you know this guy's meant to be that way, and and transitioning to his time in L.A. when they moved there, uh, wasn't he signed on on the first day he was there? No, it wasn't exactly what, the, the first day. But within the first few but days? Pretty close. Because yeah. he, he came to L.A. not knowing when you come to Hollywood, uh, you're supposed to play the game. You're supposed to get a, you know, an agent or someone to bring your, your, your tapes to, to different labels. and <laughs> He didn't do any of that. He, and he loved Hollywood, too. He told me he loved it when he first came on, like most people, because he saw record companies everywhere. And he knew this is where it's going to happen. So he was uh, very positive. But unlike pretty much everyone I've ever heard about, they were at Ben Frank's Diner on Sunset on the Sunset Strip, and he found a list of all the record companies and just started calling them. Hey, hi, this is Tom Petty. We're here from Florida. I got a demo. Can we bring it over? And back then, that would never happen today, but back then, a lot of people said, yeah. And he did have offers right away. Playboy Records was interested. Capital was interested. You know, Capital had the Beatles, but they wanted him to do a demo, and he thought, oh, I don't want to do a demo. So he, <laughs> he said no to Capital, but... Ultimately, that led to getting signed with with Shelter Records, which was Leon Russell's label. But uh, that, that just shows you his complete determination, and it, as if he already saw the dream, he'd already realized the dreams, but realized the dream before it was truly realized. But he just seemed to come. There was no question that this was going to happen, and in fact, then it didn't happen as easily as he'd hoped. It kept kind of falling apart. So there was a lot of steps before he finally got the band together and was able to get get the career going. Uh, you know, prior to that, he was in Mud Crutch, and uh, he thought that was going to be the big band, and that fell apart. So that he said, so I, it taught me if I'm going to do this again, I want to be in a band, but have my name out front. So he was smart enough to realize, I mean, he was very smart, but he understood that. To make it Tom Petty in the Heartbreakers, just in case it falls apart again, they'll know who I am. So I was impressed by that, too. He was a dreamer, but he was practical, too. You know, he understood... Uh, you know, the practical aspects of, of this business. And, and one of those that I think is reflected in, in, in some of those great stories and also show lights, you know, highlights another part of his characters, the sunglass story with uh, Leon Russell uh, at the house party where he's amongst other legends. Go into that one a little bit. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you picked up on that because to me that's such an indicative story of his, his character. Uh, this one, he was pretty new in town. For a while, they put him up at a place uh, in Encino right over the freeway. But uh, sometimes he'd get to a house it at Leon Russell's house, or on this night he was invited to a party there pretty early on after arriving in L.A., and uh, some major musicians show up, but not just anyone, Beatles, like two Beatles, uh, George and Ringo, with uh, Jim Keltner, the uh, legendary drummer. And Tom, this, this, <laughs> this is royalty. It doesn't get bigger than the Beatles. And uh, so that, uh, you know, he didn't want people to know he was new, and he wanted to kind of... Blend in, so he put on dark glasses and 
Leon immediately took him aside and said, what are you doing with those dark glasses on? You haven't earned the right to wear those. You know, Jack Nicholson had to do terrible movies, you know, before he could wear the <laughs> dark shades. And, and, uh, and uh, Tom realized, immediately took him off. But I think he really took that to heart, that from now on, if I'm going to do this, do it in a real way. Be true. That's really what it's all about. Nothing phony. And he held to that. And I think that's what really distinguished him in so many ways, that it, it wasn't ever phony or meant to fit a trend or a style or be contrived because he couldn't really uh, connect with inspiration. He, he never did that for 40 years. And uh, it's pretty, you know, quite unusual. And I think that's one reason he's so beloved by his fans and that the music is pure and real and reflects him, you know, and uh, a compassionate person and, uh, and a great storyteller. But it, it was always real and true. And in some ways, I think he uh, he got triggered uh, by, by Leon telling him that, take those glasses off. Hmm. And, and purity was a big word that that was used in the book to, to highlight him. And, and I think a lot of people don't realize, at least uh, of the younger generations, at least, and, and, and people even of my generation, because I'm 40, uh, almost 40, is that, People don't realize how huge Leon Russell and how important he really was of that time frame. When you really read about that era, you always like it. Just seems like you're always pop like Leon Russell is popping up through so many different uh, parts of that. Of that, time. yeah, that's right. I mean, the great, great songwriter, artist, p- piano player, but also a session musician. I mean, you, you, I look into old, you know, records who played on it, and often it was Leon Russell. You know, he was he was one of those cats that was on a lot of sessions and an amazing musician. And uh, so it was, it, was, it was wonderful for Tom to start being with people like that. I mean, that's what he always dreamed of after all those years. And now he's, he's with the gods of you know, songwriting and record making. And uh, it was you know, very important for him. And well, let's take a two minute intermission uh, quick and we'll go into, into the music and the songs and the songs and the songwriting. We'll be right back with Paul Zolo uh, when the mind's eye returns. We're back on the Mind's Eye conversing with Paul Zolo about his conversations with Tom Petty, a book of the same name. Definitely recommend that you uh, go grab that. And uh, let, let's get into the music. Before you said that, I think it was the uh, one of the big anniversaries for uh, Damn the Torpedoes. And, and Tom considers that. He said, I think he said this multiple times in, in the book uh, during while being interviewed that he considers it groundbreaking. In, in which way do you think that is? It, it is groundbreaking. I think he felt that... Um the songwriting was was better that he had evolved as a songwriter but also the arrangements with the band and it was the first uh, album also that Jimmy Yovine produced and I, maybe his, his greatest one Tom said you know after that Jimmy got so involved in the uh, the business side that he was often on the phone instead of uh, you know producing to the extent that Tom would take his scissors and cut the line of the phone quite often he did that more than once <laughs> but uh, he was really impressed by Jimmy Yovine's uh, Production. He thought uh, like, uh, "Refugee," for example, was the big the big hit from uh, "Damn the Torpedoes." That that Jimmy really took a song and really made a great sounding record out of it. And uh, Tom was, you know, the producer was very important to Tom. He's very uh, he's very open about everyone, but that that meant a lot to him. So it was that, but also the album was tremendously successful. I mean, suddenly their their level of fame, you know, just uh, multiplied. Uh, but they were so busy that he didn't quite even understand, you know, how successful he was becoming. It was mm. funny too, because uh, several examples, uh, they were constantly touring, and he he said he noticed the road manager had his own room, but up to that point, all the guys in the Heartbreakers would share a room always, even you know, up to damn the torpedoes. And he said to the guy, "Hey, you got your own room? Can I get mine?" And the guy goes, "Oh, you want your own room? Sure. You might want you tell me." <laughs> Time to know he could so. That was one example, but the other was, uh, he said, sometimes I'd get so much money, and they, you know, my managers would show, and i go, wow, $5,000, that's great. And they'd go, no, Tom, $50,000, you're missing a zero. <laughs> and Tom said, to me, 5000 that was enormous, 50000 it was just hard to believe all of it. So uh, it gradually, you know, the fame and the success expanded, and it, it expanded more, uh, uh, when MTV came and they became one of the biggest and, and best, most creative MTV bands doing these really wonderful videos for their songs. He said, by that point, because you're on, you're on TV all day long, that everybody knew you. He was like, even grandmothers at the airport would know you and little kids. And, uh, and that was quite a, quite a change. He wasn't, 
you know, I wasn't prepared for being that visually famous so so early on, but uh, MTV sure uh, changed that. Yeah, he had, uh, I think, one one comical part was that he had to figure out that he was rich. Nobody was telling him that he was rich, uh, which I, I thought was pretty funny. Uh, and and another little tidbit, just since you, you touched on the music video and how that really took them to that whole next level, um, is that mm-hmm. so the record companies actually make the artists pay for the video. It comes out of their record royalties, and they don't even make money off videos, which I just which just completely blew my mind. I did not know that at all. Yeah, I mean, that's one of many examples in the book of dealing with the industry. That was one of the hardest things with him. That it, you know, it is an industry, and he's an artist. And uh, he realized, uh, I mean, the MTV uh, it was a huge advantage. He said any time we had a song on an MTV, it always became a hit. There was not one that went on MTV that didn't become a hit. So it was worth it, but it was a huge amount of money. And like you said, the record company charges that to the artist. So he said, yeah, we got back uh, after one album, we realized, you know, more than a million dollars had been subtracted for the videos. So that's a lot to put out. <laughs> and, uh, but obviously, as we know, that wasn't his main concern. I mean, other people would know when they're rich. They would really know that. Or, or you know, when people want to raise the ticket prices, like on his, on his concerts, you got more money for me? Good, let's do that right away. But he didn't do that because he cared more about the fans. And yet, he said it bothered him because other bands, like the Eagles or the Rolling Stones, when their grosses would be higher, so they'd be listed as the top-grossing band, though Tom would sell more tickets. He actually had more people coming to his show, but it, and it bothered him. He said he wished people knew that, but it didn't bother him, obviously, enough that he he wanted to change it. He didn't want to outprice the fans. And same thing with when the uh, record company wanted to add a dollar to the price of his LP, and he fought that. And as you know, it's very unusual to fight that hand that's been feeding you all these years. Hmm. But he did, expecting other people, his peers, might join him, and he was disappointed to find out nobody really wanted to join him. And it was it was a hard battle, though he, though he won. It was MCA wanting to make him the first artist to raise the price, and uh, Tom felt his fans will blame him for it. But also, uh, as he said, you know, he didn't have a lot of money growing up, but he wanted to get music, and he was always keeping that in mind, that he wanted his fans to get the music. Without them, it, it was all kind of meaningless. So it's another one of those simple kind of uh, awarenesses that he had that uh, I don't know if everyone ever gets to that point. But uh, throughout the, you know, uh, his career, there are many times when he had to fight with the industry. And, you know, it's kind of, when, when I heard about it, kind of shocking. I thought at, at his level, they just give you the key, keys to the kingdom and <laughs> let you go, you know. And it was really surprising to find out how, how often he had to, uh, to battle with the industry. And I think that one mention was that uh, a full moon fever, his first solo one uh, album. They didn't, they didn't even want him to put it out, right? Yeah, I mean that's the most egregious. <laughs> and this is after like thirty. Yeah. And this is after twenty years of of just making hits after hits after hits. It just boggles right. your mind. Exactly, he's already <laughs> an established hit maker. It was a huge fan base, so that alone, you know, would give you a lot. But he comes in with full moon fever, and it was different in that it wasn't. It was his first solo album. And uh, it wasn't done with the band. It was done with Jeff Lynne. And so it had a different sound and a really charming, amazing sound. And he loved working with Jeff Lynne so much that he wrote remarkably great songs. They like got Free, free Fallen, uh, you know, his most famous song now. They wrote Overnight, he and, and Jeff. And pretty much every song on that album, they wrote Overnight and recorded right there at Jeff's home. Uh, so he brings in the album to his record company. And uh, they said, we're sorry, we're not going to put this out. We don't hear a hit. <laughs> and it turned out it had not one hit; it had five hits. I mean, it had uh, uh, "Free Fallen" and uh, I'll st- uh, I'm blanking right now on all the others. Uh, "You're So Bad," uh, "Facing the Crowd," mm-hmm. uh, five hits altogether. Yet uh, he said, "You know what happened?" Is they said no, and uh, he went home and he said, "I was really dejected." He didn't he didn't take it lightly. He because he was so excited about the album, and so was Jeff, and there was some so much infectious friendly spirit and just magical songs uh it really hurt him and he said i was i was deeply depressed and it was months went by and he and jeff lynn were at a party and uh, lenny warnker was there the president the former president of, of warner brothers and told lenny what happened and lenny said really well can i hear some of it and they, they didn't have it so they just played him free falling on the guitar and lenny goes wow that's a hit <laughs> lenny could hear it just them singing on guitar but these guys couldn't 
And the reason they couldn't, uh, you know, the way Tom explained it is the music execs used to be people that loved music and loved songs and had passion for it and education and information. But then they brought in the marketing guys. And he said the marketing suddenly took over. It used to be you get the product and then you figure out how to market it. But he said now they're marketing and trying to adjust the product to the marketing. And he, he said he knew when, when that happened that that's going to hurt rock and roll. And so the guys that uh, originally... Uh, rejected it and they were unanimous uh they were all marketing guys and a typical uh, music industry thought is this doesn't sound like what we already know because hmm. the music industry doesn't want you to do something brave and experimental necessarily they want it to keep doing what you're doing that seems to be working uh you know unless you're smart enough to understand that artists need to progress and, you know, it is kind of shocking to think you could hear all those songs free falling and not one of them there <laughs> thought, no, you know, I think maybe we should let Tom put it out. They were, they were unanimous. <laughs> so it, part of it also was that it was going to be his first uh, CD, so it needed more songs. So he added, I feel so much better, the Gene Clark song, which was great for Gene Clark, who was in the birds and needed money. It made him a huge amount of money when he needed it the most. But then he brought the, uh, Tom brought the CD back, and by that time, most of those executives weren't even there anymore, and the next guys said, oh, yeah, this is great. And they put it out, and it was tremendously successful. That's such a, an egregious example of uh, you know, what, 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 what he was dealing with in the music industry. They could bring in those. He never had an album with that many hits, and that's the one album they didn't hear any hits on. <laughs> so it's amazing, really. Yeah, hope, hopefully all those people were fired by the time he brought it back. And yeah, so many times I was just shaking my head just at the music industry itself in response to Tom Petty and even even after he made it big. And I guess I guess that was kind of like the time when, when you mentioned marketing was really starting to take over. And, and I think, and to me, something that I kind of see here is that in the mid, you know, early 90s, mid 90s, when it really started kind of reverting back to pre-Beatles where the, the music was kind of pre-packaged and inorganically put together and i think one of the reasons why people love the classic rock era so much is that it's so beloved and so unique that one i mean the music was organic and phenomenal but two the marketing in itself was the bands and the music mm, right that's right the marketing reflected the spirit of each band in a very singular way and that's what it was about that's what tom grew up with so when that shifted that was hard and it was really hard on tom when uh the industry started propelling people to become pop, you know, idols, pop artists, who Tom didn't see as having any actual talent. Uh, he said, you know, it takes a long time to develop the artistry to do this well, and he goes, there's some people out there, and they're having hits, and that's fine, but don't call them musicians, because they are not musicians. And that distinction meant a lot to him, that, uh, you know, we're musicians, and what Tom was doing with the band was real, like the Beatles, are those people playing their own music, there's nothing phony about it. It was authentic rock and roll, you know, which changed a lot since then, where, uh, you know, music changed a lot and how people made it. But that was always Tom's way. And I think that's another reason why it, it matters so much, especially nowadays when it, people are constantly uh, questioning what's real and what's true. That's one thing you can't deny. That's real. You know, you mm. like that song and those musicians. Mm. There's no denying it. And there's no, there's no trick to that either. You either can do that or you can't. You can't create create a fake way of, of getting to that and he did it you know over decades so it kind of really a uh, emblem it's really emblematic of, of of his his character that you know that purity again that authentic rock and roll but that's where he came from as he said when i was growing up those were the people that that uh, he listened to uh who were really doing it, uh, it, was, it was, they weren't the people contriving little pop songs for someone else they were the people that would get out there and whether it was buddy holly or the beatles or dylan and, you know, sing their own song. So it's an existential art. This is the music coming from that songwriter. He's singing it. He's making the records. It's very uh, intimate, uh, you know, uh, a special, singular kind of expression. Because you go see Tommy's huge shows, but it's all coming from that one guy's soul and his spirit. Mm -hmm. And he's a gentle, real person. And it was that real connection with his humanity that, that, that came across in the songs and, and his, his shows that meant so much to us and uh, I, I, he understood that and many people consider wildflowers his uh his best album start to finish uh, he considers it his favorite album uh, what about you what's your favorite album of tom's you know it's it's hard to say it's like <laughs> picking a great beatles album because there's just so much there 
I got to say though, uh, Wildflowers. And uh, as I mentioned, it was the first time I interviewed him, and they they sent me in advance before it came out. And I thought, well, I wonder if this one will be good. And then I said, oh my God! And not only was it good, he was just overflowing with songs and every kind of song, you know, uh, from slow, beautiful ballads, uh, you know, crawling back to you, to you wreck me, you know, fast rock and you know, bluesy stuff and uh, cabin down below, funny stuff, serious stuff. But uh, he was so in touch with the music. He was just overflowing with songs. And he, he wrote way more songs for Wildflowers than they could put on the album. A lot of them then came out on the, uh, the soundtrack to She's the One that he did, a movie soundtrack, that were written for Wildflowers. And as I know you know, now they're putting out a new version of Wildflowers with so many songs. But you know, it's so unusual. You know, it's hard for a lot of songwriters just to get enough material where they had a whole album. Not Tom. He was just overflowing with it at that point in his career, and it's it's kind of remarkable. Uh, so when I listen to that, I just hear, uh, you know, so much love of so many different forms, and uh, and doing it. And it's also authentically great. But I'll say that you know when I was working with him uh, uh, on the book is when he did Highway Companion, and that was another solo album, and he recorded it in his home, and that's usually where we met in his recording studio. And he'd play me tracks from it. So that one has a very special place in my heart because I just, you know, he played them for me, but I just remember his joy, like, listen to this one. <laughs> and I was just so impressed and inspired by this guy that he just loved it as much as ever, but it's really coming up with amazing songs. I mean, he wrote the song Down South, as I think I mentioned. It's kind of a, a sequel to Southern Accents about life in the South, but a funny, unusual song with a lot of funny rhymes and the... Uh, uh, you know, talks about Samuel Clemens. I'm going to dress like Samuel Clemens, wear white linen, and really playful, but reflecting uh, the South and, and really interesting uh, language in that song and wonderful music. And uh, he was so proud of that song. Uh, so I always think of that one. Or turn this turn this car around was the first one he played me, which is the opening cut, and and just just great and a different sound too. You know, Jeff Lynne was producing that with him, but it, it didn't sound like uh, Full Moon Fever. And also, Tom actually played drums himself on that album. Hmm. Uh, he said, yeah, I could play drums, you know, in the studio. I couldn't do it live. You know, he's always kind of being uh, humble that way. But uh, it's pretty amazing. He played his own drums on that, and they, they sound great. Uh, and it also showed me, just, uh, while we were working, uh, he told me Dana just needed to get away because he just worked all the time. So he promised her, uh, take a little vacation. We'll go to Mexico and just be us. I won't even bring a guitar, so I won't work. And Dana said, okay, great. But when he got there, he realized almost immediately, like, ah, I need a guitar. <laughs> <laughs> and she loved it. I mean, she understood. You know, it's like a, a cigarette smoker not having a cigarette. It's like, come on, get you, get you what you need. So he asked the hotel for uh, if they could get him a guitar, and he said, just get me a cheap one. But being Tom Petty, they got him a really beautiful, expensive Spanish gut string guitar, which he said he loved. And he kept it, but uh, he immediately got to work. And he, while on vacation, this is what he wanted to do. He uh, finished Down South, and then he wrote a whole other song, uh, Around the Roses, which is, they're both on Highway Companion. But that shows you, even on his even on his vacation, that's what he wanted to do more than anything, get the guitar and work on songs. And he truly, truly loved it, and he also said that he, you know his greatest hits aren't necessarily uh, his best songs. And um, what, yes. Did he ever mention, I don't think I saw this, but did he ever mention to you that, uh, uh, you know, a favorite song of his that I guess was more of a, a deep cut, a deep track that, you know, wasn't popular? Oh, yeah. There were several of them. Uh, the first one that comes to mind is because when I interviewed him, it's one thing I like to do uh, with songwriters, especially hit songwriters, is mention their great songs that weren't hits. Because these guys know often it's, and they're, they're great songs, Tom's hits, but usually the, the simpler songs on the albums are the ones that could be hits. Normally a ballad can't be a hit, so there's a lot of great songs that just don't qualify. But the songwriter knows, boy, that's some of my greatest work. And I was just in love with the song, uh, uh, Two Gunslingers, a uh, wonderful song from Into the Great Wide Open. And it's a, a funny song, it's about two gunslingers realizing that, you know, this job they have is not a sustainable kind of way to em employ yourself. And uh, they start questioning their existence and taking control of their lives and deciding maybe we shouldn't shoot each other. It was really a brilliant, funny anti-war song, but set in the Old West to rock and roll. And so unlikely, and yet you hear it, and it's just, perfect you know and uh and that one's not so weird that i don't think it could have been a, it could have been a hit i think there's several of them 
had they made those singles and put them on MTV, that they would have become hits. But as soon as I mentioned that one to him, it meant so much to him, you know. And he said, thank you for bringing that one up. I really like that song. <laughs> and uh, we kind of bonded because of that. That kind of started it. But throughout our time, I'd bring up songs uh, that got dismissed or didn't get much uh, attention. And it, it always meant a lot to him, like a parent with, uh, you know, those three kids get all the attention. But these guys are pretty great, too. And uh, so that was one. Also, the song Insider uh, is an amazing song. He, he wrote that because uh, Jimmy Yovine started working with Stevie Nicks, and they encouraged Tom to write a duet uh, for he and Stevie to sing. And he sat down and wrote The Insider, which is a, a remarkably beautiful, painful song, a lot of hurt, but musically just resplendent and so inspired. And uh, uh, Stevie, he loved her singing. She's, as we know, uh, an amazing uh harmony singer she's just really talented at that uh uh and it had to be really great to impress tom and he just looked like he had stevie you know not many people can do that uh so she came in you know he recorded his part and then uh she she uh, recorded uh harmony to that song and it sounded so great tom said you know i felt like i don't want to give this one away he felt bad about it but it was so powerful and he said to stevie would would you mind terrible if i kept this one but because she was a songwriter, she did understand. But she said, I will, but you have to get me another one. And so he had already recorded Stop Dragging My Heart Around, but uh, just by himself. And so uh, he, they, he gave that to her and to Jimmy Ovine, and they turned that into a duet, which surprised me. I thought he tailor-made it for him because it sounds that way. But right. uh, in fact, he didn't at all. But uh, Insider is one of those that uh, remains, you know, uh, could have been a hit. Same thing, Southern Accents, which I've mentioned, the, the title song of that album, one of his great songs. I think of it like his Let It Be, including that there's a vision of his mother that comes uh, in the middle in the bridge. And that wasn't that wasn't a hit, but I, I think uh, definitely one of his greatest songs. What's your favorite deep oh, cut from him? There's many. I mean, I was mentioning on Wildflowers, like Crawling Back to You. I think that's mm. one of his most essential songs. That wasn't a hit. Though he did start doing it in concert. But uh, it's so Tom and that line about, you know, most things I worry about never happen anyway. I'm so tired of being tired. Sure, as nighttime turns to day, most things that I worry about never happen anyway. Uh, he said, that, that's me. And he realized that about himself. All that worry, it's not even usually about something that ever happens. And that he put that across in that beautiful song. And, uh, you know, it's really a special song. Uh, it's got a real kind of sad edge to it. Uh, uh, and it's really kind of a, some desperation there, but but beautiful. Uh, you know, I think pretty much every album has those. There's so many of those songs, like uh, even songs he'd write for uh, Mud Crutch when he brought back Mud Crutch. Those wonderful songs, Scare Easy, and uh, it's really staggering. There's very few people I can think of that just kept up so much quality in their songwriting over the years. So his deep cuts, there's so many of them. I th and, and we consider him one of the greatest American rock and roll singers and, and songwriters of the time. But um, in some ways, he's almost underrated because he really did just keep putting out pretty. I think he was one of the few classic rock artists, particularly of that era, that he would still be churning out great music. Um, Lost Highway is a pretty. I was looking for a classic rock album uh, station at the time. That's a great album. Like you meant the, the Mud Crutch revival. Um, those were really great. Um, so he was still, I mean, turning out pretty great music like you said, four decades in one of the few classic rock artists that were really doing that. Yeah. I mean, as you know, it's much more common to do great work in your 20s, maybe your early mm -hmm. 30s, and then go downhill. That's common, and it's it's understandable, too. It, it takes a lot of energy and inspiration to, to create something at that level and to keep doing it. There aren't a lot of examples of people that, you know, did it. There are people that came back after being gone, but to do it with such consistency. It wasn't really a period... Uh, you know, when he put out an album that just seemed like filler or wasn't inspired, mm -hmm. uh, he wouldn't do that. But it, it's because he, he cared so much. You know, it meant more to him than anything. Uh, you know, even his, his final album, the studio album, Hurricane Eye, uh, is brilliant, brilliant songs. Uh, fault Lines, I mean, just, just great songs. American Dream, Part B. And then there were also albums that he put out, like The Last DJ, uh, which was really... Uh, well, it came off as an indictment of the music industry and of radio. It really upset him because he was introduced to rock and roll through radio, and he loved radio. Uh, uh, that when that changed, when suddenly DJs couldn't make choices about what songs, and they weren't choosing him because people were wanting him or requesting him, 
which is how it used to be. So it was an authentic system that people want to hear that song. That's the number one. When that changed and suddenly they were dictating what got on the hit parade, Tom did not like that. And the same thing with the record companies, like we're saying. So uh, the that last DJ was about that and also about what we were saying about uh, certain artists who were, became pop stars who really had no musical artistry. All of that bothered him, but when that album came out, these were very, uh, you know, explicitly angry songs, but, but, but beautifully written, obviously, and great, I thought. Uh, but a lot of people in the industry felt that was Tom, you know, attacking them. And in some ways it was, but he said, uh, I didn't mean it like that. It was just, to me, that was the symbol of how the entire world is changing, how modern times is. Uh, but always with songwriters, they take them literally. That's, he's saying that because it's not meant to suggest anything else. Uh, but that was brave, you know, that he did that, that he put out an album, because that's what he believed in, you know, that, like we said, you know, he has got this, uh, people have this impression that he's easy going, laid back, but when he saw something he didn't like, he would he would fight, you know, even writing a whole album about, you know, this is a, a change in our culture that isn't isn't good. And, uh, you know, it's an, another reason he's really special. Hmm. Uh, and my, You know, I wanted to say to uh, yeah, about please. my trip, but... I, I, I totally agree that he gets underrated, and I've seen this up front. And I I think the reason is, that, like we were saying, that he makes the songs seem like they're so perfect that it almost seems they're just, you know, just came out of him, you know, that d- took no labor, whereas you hear, you know, Subterranean Homesick Blues by Dylan or uh, mm. I Am the Walrus, and, you know, that guy's a genius who wrote that. But Tom's were so brilliantly put together, and, and he kept that simplicity and the way he sang, I think people thought, you know, how, how hard is that? And I even saw this, uh, after Tom's death, they had an event when American Treasure came out in, in L.A., and his band was there, and his managers, and Dana, and uh, all the DJs in town, I know, and music uh, journalists. And one of them, the DJ said to me, uh, you know what, I never played him once. I go, why? I just didn't want to. You, you couldn't hear any song good for radio from Tom <laughs> Petty in 40 years, but it was this kind of thing that he's so popular, I'm not going to go there. And I talked to one of the, I won't name by name, but a pretty well-known music critic in L.A. who's not, who's retired now. But uh, he asked me, like, uh, Paul, who do you think will be important 50 years from now? And I said, uh, I'd say Tom Petty. No, why, why would you say that? Well, he's one of the greatest songwriters of our time, and his you know, the awareness of that just seems to be expanding. It is one of the hugest, most devotional fan bases and left this amazing catalog of songs. He goes, name one song people will remember. I said, okay, uh, Free Fall. How about that? He goes, nope, bad song. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's what we're dealing with. But it just reflected that kind of attitude. I think some people had this, uh, this uh, reaction against the enormous pop- popularity of him, like that signal that he wasn't great in some ways, where they had to you know, dignify themselves by not liking Tom Petty, but I, I thought that was insane. You would think after 40 years, I mean, I thought it became pretty clear by the time of Full Moon Fever, this guy is capable of anything, <laughs> and he's just going to keep doing it. I mean, he was already great, and then he kept expanding and trying different stuff. It's like the Beatles did, but on his own, and four times as long. But uh, there's really no excuse for those guys never, never to get it, but I think that's exactly what happened. But I also think that's one of the reasons his fans are so energized, to celebrate him because they know and they've always known and you know he was doing it for them so i think in some ways that creates a greater energy as well yeah put some damn respect on his name my god this is only one of the greatest songwriters of all time jeez and 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 yeah. he really did would do anything you, you didn't really know what to expect from him i mean really at the, like at the height of their fame or and they could do anything they just chose to, hey, you know what, I'm just going to go be the backing band for Bob Dylan and, and Johnny Cash for a little bit. It's like, okay. Right. And what other, what other band of their ilk and of their level would just go do that? Right. You're right. No ego. And yet, again, that reflects Tom's reverence for right. the great songwriters. I mean, him playing with Johnny Cash was huge. And same thing with Dylan. They go out on the road with Dylan. I mean, come on, Bob Dylan. That meant a lot to him. Uh, and and they they obviously did the gig uh, except for maybe the band who played with Dylan. Nick, I don't think Dylan's ever had a, a band that was that great. And it's funny too that he Tom said like sometimes Dylan just to to mess us up would just throw out a song that none of us knew like an Ink Spot song 
that none of us knew. He said, except Benmont. Benmont could play anything. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Uh, and before I, I, I let you go, I guess I'd be remiss to not to bring up one of those great moments in, uh, in times uh, when he was working with, uh, you know, the traveling Will Berries. And my dad is a huge Roy Orbison fan, so he he probably, uh, you know, beat me if I didn't uh, at least uh, <laughs> uh, bring them up a, a little bit. So uh, but it just like it was amazing that, to, that they even got together. I mean, there, it seemed really organic, their origin story for them all being so huge. Yeah. Yeah, you're right, very special, and it was interesting when I was working with Tom on the book, there were certain stories he would tell that were sad, and I felt the sadness so powerfully, he was so expressive, and there were a few times he'd tell stories that he was just so joyful, I just felt such exultation from him, it was palpable, you could feel it, you know, when he was in front of 50,000 people, they could feel it, so sitting there with him, it was powerful, and when he talked about the Wilburys, uh, nothing more joyful, I think, except talking about Dana, but the Wilburys was just pure delight for Tom, because that was, you know, there weren't many people Tom Petty looked up to, but Bob Dylan, Roy Orbison, Jeff Lynne, George Harrison, I mean, these are, you know, the gods of, of rock and roll and songwriting, but all very close friends, you know, with all of them, he became very close, he and George Harrison were very close friends, and, uh, and you know, Dylan was there, you know, and uh, uh, it meant so much to him, because it wasn't done like, we'll, we'll get together and we'll, we'll come up with a hit, it was just done for fun. They just loved doing it, and they had a great time doing it. They'd write a song that day and record it that night. And for Tom, too, having Roy Orbison in the band, and for Jeff Lynne, was a huge thrill. Because they, they originally just did one song, Handle With Care, and then they thought, you know, let's do a whole album. But will Roy be in on it? And they, they drove out to Anaheim uh, to ask him. when Roy was uh, doing a show. And when Roy said yes, Tom said, George Harrison and I, we were like little boys. We couldn't believe that Roy <laughs> Orbison was in our band. You know, for them, that was enormous, you know. And, uh, and they just had so much fun. Uh, you know, when he talked about it, it was just pure delight. He loved being with those guys. And it was, it was fun. So George Harrison was kind of casting, like, uh, you sing this part and you sing that part. And, you know, he said, I'm standing next to Roy Orbison and I'm singing. <laughs> he found that funny. But uh, he said, but any time Roy would open his mouth, it was just amazing. He also said Roy was one of the funniest people he ever met. You might not guess that, but he was always telling jokes. Never took off the sunglasses either, he said. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Tom loved that uh, probably more than anything. I, I never felt so much just pure joy and, you know, happiness when he, when he discussed it. And I think one of the things that give me the most pure joy, and I, I actually do put this on at least twice a, a year, is that 2004 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame cover of While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Um, yeah. And and Prince just he just absolutely kills. It. Just thinking about it right now actually just gives me gives me uh, tingles. And, you know, so me he's too. just I'm feeling the same thing. <laughs> he's just always around these amazing moments. Uh, and and, yeah. I, and just then that's just Tom Petty. He's just he's just always around during those those great moments in music. Yeah, I mean it was so beautiful. They're doing this tribute for George who was gone, and Danny George's son is on stage. It looks just like a real young George. Mm. <laughs> uh, but there's Prince. And he's just kind of, you know, playing along, you know, at first, and then it's time for a solo, and he just took it off. And it was amazing. Prince is already gone, and Tom's gone, but that moment just shows that greatness. And Prince was transcendent. He took this guitar solo. It wasn't meant to be that long, but he just kept going, and it was phenomenal. And one of the best parts of that, uh, I'm sure you know, is seeing Tom's face and Danny's <laughs> yeah. face. Just, Whoa! <laughs> like, they were up. fans, just like we were living through them. Like, they were just fans like us watching it happen, you know? Right, you saw it in their faces, and then Prince ended after this amazing, you know, epic guitar solo. He takes his guitar, all you see is he throws it yep. to the audience. <laughs> he has this, you know, guy there to, to catch it. Just but, walks away. I mean, that was showbiz and transcendent music all at once, and uh, you're right, you know, it all centered around Tom. So many great memories of Tom, and that's one of them. What about you? What, what's your favorite memory of him? You know, when I think of Tom, I think when I would show up at his house, you know, like I said, it would always be noon, but he was just waking up, and he'd have this sleepy look in his eyes, and often he'd have these funny outfits that he'd wear. He'd always wear kind of playful clothes, like one time a funny, like, really bright green and orange plaid suit, and this kind of attitude, like, can you believe someone who would wear this? <laughs> it was always <laughs> whimsical and funny. But he'd look kind of sleepy, and uh, but he'd go, like, what are we going to talk about today? And he just had an eagerness to get into it and start talking, and as soon as I was with him, I was just happy. You know, like all of the rest of life would go away, and just to be there with him, he had 
so much joy. And yet there was a lot of sorrow, too. He dealt with some really, really tough stuff. A crazy fan literally burnt down his house, yeah. the one in Encina where he was living with his wife and his kids. Could have killed him. He saved his family by having them jump in the swimming pool. Uh, his, his, his housekeeper's hair was on fire, and he put her, he put her out. Mm. But uh, needless to say, that freaked him out, you know, with good reason. Uh, John Lennon had been killed uh, by a fan, and then George Harrison got stabbed to death viciously. And Tom said, you know, that attack on George, that was much worse than they ever let on. That was a terrible thing. So, I mean, he wasn't just paranoid. He had good reason to, to worry, and uh, he had various stalkers trying to get him. And there was, there was this stalker who... who burnt down his house. At first, they were just hoping or thinking it must have been some accident uh, with the house, but then the fire people said, no, this is where they broke in and they threw in the can, you know, and uh, the thought that a fan would, it really hurt him, that not only burn, try to hurt him, but take out his whole family, mm. you know, uh, that that was devastating to Tom. Uh, several times like that. It blew him out of the water, but he, uh, you know, he was a survivor. He kept going and, uh, he built that house back up. He thought symbolically that was important. So there were situations like that that, that were really tough, or, or the, probably the hardest was when Howie Epstein is a bass player, OD'd. Uh, that, was, that was tough. And Tom told me that story. I never felt so much sorrow from him. It, it was just so dark. And I think he took it on himself that he was responsible in some ways for it, that uh, he could have done more, though I don't think he could have. But uh, there were a lot of situations like that. And the, the divorce were really tough on the guy. It wasn't just a, a nonstop uh, party for Tom Petty by any means. But he never was derailed by anybody. He always picked himself up and would return to do great work and uh, surpass all that. And I was glad just to see that his life ended with you know, 20 years, I think it was, with Dana. That He was really a happy guy when he was with Dana. It was great to, to see him there. And uh, I'm glad his, he had that kind of happiness uh, you know, for so long at the end of his life. You know, it always seemed like he would come back stronger, make lemonade from from lemons. You know that yeah. arson one that you mentioned. If that didn't happen, we, I mean, we wouldn't have the great lyric, you know, gliding over Mulholland and free falling, because uh, I think that right. came from him uh, staying at a, you know, I guess a rental place off there. So, you know, whatever right, yeah. when bad things happen, he would he'd make lemonade from it. So, uh, and, and yeah, one and, and right. yeah, and one thing that uh, he wrote the original foreword to 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 the book, and he wrote that uh, this is not an autobiography that. That is for another book and, and another time, and, and that never happened. Um, was that ever in the works, coalescing an autobiography of sorts, do you know? It was. Dana told me that just before his death, he started working on it, mm. and he, he wanted to do that. Uh, so when we did our book, it was never intended to be a, that. The idea originally was a series of conversations about art and music and songs, and because that's what we had done you know, for magazines prior to that many times. Uh, that was the idea. But it became pretty apparent quickly on that uh, all his songs were about his life, and all his life tied into his songs. So it became, you know, the history of his life, and he told a lot of stories about his family and starting out, and it became more of that than uh, I'd, I'd expected, and I, I was glad it did. It really is, is both. But at the same time, we also went through, at that time, every song he'd recorded, even ones that uh, you know, didn't get on albums that were on the, the anthology and uh, so, you know, it was very complete in that way that we went through all his work very seriously. But uh, I think we both appreciated that it kind of turned around and it was more integrated that way that it, and he really got into a lot of the details of his life. In many ways, this just I feel like conversations with Tom Petty just feels more appropriate, a straight up autobiography. Of course, it would have been yeah. amazing. But, you know, in this way, just it really just seems like this is the spirit of Tom, him talking about the music and, and in his own words and, and how he loves it. And it's not really much, much filter. And it really, really bleeds through. And it really is a, just a splendid book to to enjoy and, uh, and to read real quick, too, obviously. And uh, um, I guess you. oh, I'm very honored to be to have been the guy to get to do that. But I feel that, too, that I didn't take his words and then paraphrase them and put them in my language. That's Tom talking, and that's exactly how he talked to him. And, uh, except for one or one incident when he did something over, that was just what came out. He spoke perfectly, too, and, uh, and it's great stories. But you, you can really feel who, who the guy is, because that's that's Tom Solder, and uh, you know he was very honest, and you really get a sense of the guy in a way you wouldn't uh, if, it, if it wasn't in his own words. Truly. So I feel tremendously lucky and privileged to have gotten to do it. 
And I feel the same way for you sharing those those conversations with uh, with me and, and our listeners about him on his birthday. And, um, and let me at least pay a little homage to you, by the way. I am actually a, bit, a fan of uh, Dan Byrne, and I, I think I yeah. read somewhere that you uh, that you read uh, wrote a couple songs with him or, or for him. Uh, what tracks were those? No, with if you don't him. Know, uh, yeah, with him. Not, definitely not for him. He doesn't need me to write songs. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, he's but, uh, kind of I've known Dan for a long time. I helped him. Uh, he was just starting out. We, he was in some of our showcases, and quickly, you know, he ascended because he's an amazing songwriter. Mm-hmm. But we wrote, uh, it's actually the two fastest songs I've ever written because he's just so on fire. Uh, the first one was called Midnight in Nebraska because mm-hmm. Dan and I had been doing some shows together, mm. uh, and we were doing live, one was a live uh, webcast, you know, a live show, and a woman wrote in during the show, you know, it's already midnight in Nebraska, you know, uh, I guess 10 o'clock in L.A., and both of us said on camera, well, that's a song. But we didn't write it for the longest time. But finally I said, yeah, we've got to write Midnight in Nebraska. So I sent him some lyrics, and immediately he wrote back some other lyrics. And I sent him more, and we wrote the lyric like on Facebook, going back and forth very quickly. And then he wrote the music himself very fast, and wonderful music. And uh, the other song, these are both on his album called Adderall Holiday. Yep, that's the yep. name of the album. The other one is uh, Chuck the Rest, because a friend of ours had written a book on Dylan, and he asked me how the book was, and I said, well, some of the chapters I think are great, not all. He goes, well, just read the good chapters and chuck the rest. And I thought, uh, one of us said, well, let's write that song, chuck the rest. <laughs> we wrote that probably in 10 minutes, too, and uh, he recorded it. And I love that. You know, Dan, he, he's, he's great. He's, he's so on fire that he could just uh, take a song and just go with it and complete it. Uh, it's exciting working with him. I love Dan. Mm, it's been exciting talking to you. And is, is there anything that you uh, want to promote, social media, any social media, anything else uh, before I let you go? Well, I should plug my, my job because they have me employed. I'm um, one of the editors of American Songwriter. So if you go to americansongwriter.com, my stories are there every day. I'm churning them out. In fact, I just did one today on, on Refugee, as I mentioned, being the uh, anniversary of when it came out. And tomorrow I'll do one. And Tom also has such huge fan, you know, the Tom Petty Nation of fans is so extensive that uh, they love any story about Tom. They're such grateful, wonderful people. So uh, that's that's one way if you want to read my stuff, uh, American Songwriter. And I also have a book called Songwriters on Songwriting uh, and, and a sequel to that were interviews with uh, you know, all the great songwriters that I was able to talk to, including Tom. Tom's in the first one, uh, an interview that's not in the book we did. And one of my... Uh... One of my favorite lines from from the book, Conversations with Tom Petty, uh, and I'm going to steal this line from you, by the way, and I'll, but I'll give you all uh, credit for it, is that uh, you always hear Tom's, uh, Tom Petty singing on your spiritual radio. I just thought that was really uh, a lovely way, a lovely, just how you said that, just so framed lovely. Well, that's referring, I, I guess, you know, to his song, Spiritual Radio, which mm-hmm. was on uh, She's the One album. One of the songs he didn't think was that great, because it, <laughs> I, I just think it's amazing and it kind of reflects where he is, you're t- tuning into a spiritual radio, and uh, I think that's where, where Tom remains. It's really a, b- a great conversation uh, with Paul Zolo here, sharing his uh, conversations with Tom Petty, member book of the same name. Highly recommend you re- recommend it. Thank you so much for, for your time, Paul. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. I appreciate it. Pleasure's all mine. Mind's Eye wrap up when we come back. Mind's Eye wrap up. Yeah, I love that little session right there. One last time, happy birthday, Tom Petty. Big thanks to Paul Zolo, two very fine gentlemen tonight. And I guess we've officially blown the candles on that one. So on the next one, uh, we're going to look at some other phenomenal gentlemen performing in, well, uh, not so uh, gentlemanly ways. New York Times bestselling author Eleanor Herman She uncovers the bedroom secrets of American presidents, uh, featured in her book, Sex with Presidents, The Ins and Outs of Love and Lust in the White House. Just think of the next one that we're going to relieve you, oh yeah, from all your election blues. Uh, Until then, be well and let well be. I'm DJ BJ Turnoff signing off for The Mind's Eye. The Mind's Eye with BJ Turnoff is available on Stitcher Radio, Podbean, iTunes, and all major platforms. Thanks for listening. Thanks for subscribing. <laughs>